Welcome everyone. My name is Tammy Wilson and I am from the Sacramento County Office of Education and I am the project lead on the California Dyslexia Initiative. We are really excited to share this webinar series with you and to have so many friends and colleagues from around the state joining us in this learning opportunity. Um, this is our fifth webinar in this expert literacy series that we're having, Understanding Dyslexia. And today we are featuring Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen, and we are so excited to have her here. I know that we are going to learn a lot. It's gonna be a wonderful opportunity. We have created a Padlet that will uh, include the, uh, a PDF of the slides. So if you like to follow along with slides, please locate the Padlet. The link has been dropped in the chat for you. There are also some additional resources from previous uh, webinars on that Padlet. And you will find that we have created a companion document that goes along with today's webinar with a deeper opportunity to explore some of the topics discussed in today's webinar. Uh, next slide. Our, as I mentioned, I am the project lead on the California Dyslexia Initiative. And one of our major goals is to really to try to disseminate professional learning opportunities and to build capacity across our state to really support students at risk for reading difficulty and students with dyslexia. So this webinar series is part of those efforts. And in this webinar series, we have partnered, next slide, with um, our wonderful partner, Jessica Hammond. Um, with Glean Education, who is going to be facilitating today's webinar. Um, and so I'm gonna hand off to Jessica right now. Thank you, Tammy. We are so thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series. For those of you who don't know us, we're Glean Education, and we partner with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training, school leader consulting, and web-based coaching. Our work aims to build educator understanding of evidence-based literacy practices to improve student literacy outcomes. Next slide, please. This is the fifth in a series of webinars on dyslexia and literacy delivered by some of the nation's top experts in the field. If you haven't registered for them yet, please do. And uh, when we'll pop those registration links in the chat, be sure not to miss them. Next slide, please. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen. <laughs> She is a bilingual speech language pathologist and certified academic language therapist. She is the director of the Speech Language and Learning Center in Brownsville, Texas. Dr. Cardenas Hagen works with the Texas Institute for Measurement, Evaluation, and Statistics and the University of Houston and was co-principal investigator of a study funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and the Institute for Education Science that examined the oracy and literacy development in English and Spanish speaking children. Dr. Cardenas Hagen has written many scholarly journals, programs, and published works, including her recent book, Literacy Foundations for English Learners, a Comprehensive Guide to Evidence-Based Instruction. Dr. Cardenas Hagen has been recognized for her dedication to individuals with dyslexia. She is the recipient of the Margaret Bird Rawson Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Dyslexia Association and the Luke Waits Award of Service to People with Dyslexia by the Academic Language Therapy Association and the Champion of Dyslexia Award by the Texas Education Agency. Dr. Cardenas Hagen has spent the last two years working with the national research teams, designing assessments and interventions for English learners who struggle with learning to read. She has a passion for ensuring that every school child in the world has access to high quality, has access to a high quality educator who can implement effective language and literacy instruction to diverse populations. Um, and I do hear a little bit of a reverb. Do you hear that as well, Tammy? Um, no, and Elsa doesn't. So that's interesting. Um, I will go on mute and hopefully 
that will go away. It's perhaps one of the participants is not muted, but we'll take care of it. So I welcome Elsa Cardenas Hagen. Thank you. Apologize for the technical difficulties. Oh, no, no, no that's happy great. To have you here. Thank you so, so much. And I'm so delighted to be here and delighted that you all out there have an interest on in working with these students that, you know, don't speak English as their native language. They're learning English, they're learning literacy. And there's so much that we need uh, to think about. And as I look there at your previous participants, I, I um, you know, I have worked very closely uh, at the University of Houston with Jack Fletcher and David Francis for now we're going on 25 years uh, and have had that opportunity to really be involved in these national studies where we really um, do need to know uh, more and we need to continue to look and, and um, you know, right now the studies are focused also on adolescence, which I saw that some of you out there um, are, um, you know, in that, you know, middle school or high school level. And so we, we, there's so much we still need to look at, but, but for the last 20 or so years, um, this is what we know, what we uh, have discovered with um, colleagues across uh, the United States. And I wanna share that, but, but more importantly, what I wanna share are for those of you out there in the field that this is what we know and this is what we need to do. And I, I'm really hopeful that today there's going to be um, some wonderful, um, some wonderful techniques that perhaps will be very easy for you to implement tomorrow. And I'm going to ask you to set some goals for that. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And um, we'll just uh, welcome each and every one of you. You're very special for wanting to help every child, including children who are learning English as their second language. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to go through who are these children? Uh, what about their language and literacy needs? What about becoming multi-literate or at least bi-literate? What does that effective instruction look like? And what can I do to make sure that I'm designing lessons that take into consideration what we've learned over the last you know, 25 uh, years and what are your next steps gonna be? So but as we start, you can put in the chat box, I wanna know, how many English learners do you think attend public schools in the United States? How many is it? Do you know? And what is the most common language? So how many and what's the common language? So if you'll put some of that in the chat box, I'm going to check and see what you're thinking, see if you're close to my number. Ooh, yeah, some of you are, some of you, oh my gosh, some of you really know your stuff. All right. So yes, so I uh, will like to tell you that it's actually uh, 5 million, 5 million. And what do you think the most common language is? You were right, Spanish is that most common language with more than 77% of our English learners speaking um, Spanish in their homes. And the second most common language, we'll, we look at Arabic, right? And that's uh, about 2.5% of these English learners. I also want to know how prepared do you feel you are to teach literacy to these students? Are you very prepared, mostly prepared, somewhat prepared, or you don't feel prepared? Let's put that in the chat box. Just trying to get an idea. Very good. So we have kind of across the board. Thank you for that, I see. All right, so as we think about that preparedness, I do have something to share with you that when we look across the United States, it's 3% of teachers that have the specialty in teaching students who are English learners. So we know that we wanna do better than 3%, um, but we do know that many school districts and many universities are helping to make sure that our professionals really are prepared to teach these students. So as I begin, now you heard, <laughs> you heard Jessica say speech and language pathologist, right? So of course we know that as we look at students, who are multilingual, who are learning languages, they're learning literacy, that language is that very foundation for literacy. 
And when we think about language, Dr. Bloom and Leahy, they're the ones that really helped us think and conceptualize that this interaction between the sounds of the language, the phonology, the meaning of the words, the semantics, the knowledge that within words, there's these word parts called morphemes, these small units of meaning that can really open the door for expanding that knowledge of semantics. And that every language in the world has these rules about how words can go together or not go together to form cohesive sentences. But it's really all about the use of language. And so that's what we call pragmatics, being able to understand the, that use of the language, being very culturally aware and understanding, for example, uh, in the English language for uh, folks like myself, even that we learn English as our second language, you know, we're always challenged by idioms and sayings. And then, you know, we might be considered advanced bilinguals or multilinguals, but here's the thing, we're always learning, we're always learning. But these components of language are so necessary for reading. And you probably know about the research synthesis in this population of students. You all know, I know you know, in the year 2000, that National Reading Panel Report but by the year 2006, we had that national literacy, you know, panel report for language minority children and youth. Looking at how does this, how do those five components that we know of, phonological awareness and, and phonics and fluency and uh, vocabulary and comprehension, how does that work for this population of students? Well, yes. We also know reading is a process. You know, our brains are, you know, to, we're ready for language, but reading is something that we have to learn. But when we look at the process of reading and what's going on in the brain, we see it's similar for all kinds of learners and all kinds of languages. And so what we know is that we are going to work on these areas of reading, just like the National Reading Panel report told us, but we've got to adjust our instruction. And how do you adjust that instruction? You are building the student's native language knowledge, building while you're building the literacy. It doesn't happen have to happen sequentially, no. As you're developing language, you can be developing literacy. And your language supports literacy, and literacy supports your language. And so let's take this as an asset point of view, that these students have knowledge. And when they come to our classrooms, that they have these features of their languages that are such a resource, right? And what we need to know, I might not know the language, but I need to be aware of the structure of that language so that I can use that to make connections across the languages and really embed these cross-linguistic features. And you may not know this, but the report also talks about students who have this native language literacy, they're going to perform higher in English literacy than those that didn't have the opportunity to develop their native language, to develop that native language literacy. And they only, you know, did English. And so that was, you know, something that was also important and not uh, as widely known. And then we have the National Academy of Science, Sciences, Engineering, and, and um. Uh, medicine. And here in this, the promoting the educational success of children and youth learning English, this came out in 2017. And it also describes the promising practices are in fact, to look at these literacy components of phonemic awareness and phonics and fluency, vocabulary, reading comprehension, and extending into writing, but also thinking about language and that oral language proficiency. In the year, just so that you know a little bit of history, in the year 2014, at the International Dyslexia Association, and I was serving at the board at the time, we were trying to really come up with a nice term that would really reflect what we knew about literacy, about learning to read, and how comprehensive it must be. And so by June of 2014, we adopted this term, structured literacy. And it's our hope that this is in every classroom, and especially in those early years, so that students really understand the structure of the language. And just notice there, they're understanding the speech sound system, the sounds, the meanings of words, semantics, those meaningful word parts, morphology, the structure of sentences, syntax. Let's extend it into writing, that orthography. But understanding that oral and written discourse so that every student can have that deep reading and written communication. 
But we can't forget the other aspects of cognition that's related to literacy acquisition. And we know this quite well. I've got to have my students engage. I've got to have their attention and their concentration. And I've got to have some wonderful reasoning skills and putting two and two together and knowledge about you know, text structure. All of that falls into this comprehensive approach for instruction that we call structured literacy. And today I share with you, what does structured by literacy mean? It means exactly the same. However, it's that understanding potentially in two or more languages, the understanding of the phonology, the words, the word parts, the syntax, the orthography, but also understanding how language and written discourse, right? How it works in two or more languages, but also being culturally and linguistically responsive. As we bring in culture, as we bring in language, you know, we know that, you know, just because I bring in culture, it's not going to teach me to read, but what it does is engages me and it motivates me to read more about all these different cultures. But being linguistically responsive, that does make a difference for reading. And so we want every teacher to know about how biliteracy develops and about first language and second language development so that you can meet your students' needs in both language and literacy. So let's talk about the early skills. And, you know, sometimes you hear people, I'd like to break a myth that, for example, that phonemes aren't important in other languages. And so really the research has really pointed out, even looking at brain research, where all this occurs, but we know that ability to process the sounds, to blend the sounds, to segment and manipulate them, that will predict how well children will do and how well they're able to link that for learning to read. So this phoneme awareness, it does contribute to reading, not only in the English language, but in other languages like the Spanish language, like in Arabic, and like even languages that are pictographic, we're finding that, right? And so when we look at phoneme awareness and we look at that capability, we see these connections across languages. And so if your students have these capabilities in their native language, it pays off for English reading. And I'm going to share to you, um, so I was going to share to you, uh, well, I didn't get to share. So Braun and Martin, Lee Braun and Martin, and this, these studies were done at the University of Houston and had, you know, more than a thousand children. And these were bilingual children speaking Spanish as their first language. And the correlation between that ability of the Spanish language and that phoneme awareness to the English language, imagine this, 0.92. If I had 1.0, that would be a perfect correlation. I am 0.08 off from it being perfect. So what does that 0.08 potentially, what does that represent? Why wasn't it 1.0? Well, because you know, I think about a language of Spanish, which we say has 22 or 24 sounds, but the English language, some will say 44 sounds, some will say 46. Either way that you look at it, English has double the number of sounds in a language like Spanish. It has more sounds than most languages. And so it's really paying attention to those sounds that don't exist from their native language. So if your students are able to do these kinds of phoneme awareness skills in their own language, that's a great indicator that they're gonna do well in English reading. But what you need to do is you need to figure out well, let me kind of look at these new sounds of the English language and let me do so to meet these students, the, their individual needs. So what I'm asking you to do is to focus on those new sounds. So one of the new and challenging sounds in the English language is that sound J. So if I look right here at these samples here, say the word ham, can you change to J? What's my new word? Jam. Right? So that's a challenging word, jam. Say the word bet, change b to j, jet. Say the word pig, change b to j, jig. Say the word hog, change b to j, jog. But for my students who are English learners, I'm not only working on that new sound of j, also going to be extending that potentially to the vocabulary in case they don't know it and linking that to the letter so they can actually see what we're doing. So here's this. Jam. You said jam. Do you know what it means in this? Well, here's one example. Ah, oh, that has like strawberry jam that you can put on toast. 
In your language, how do you say it? Halea, very good. And there's a jet, an example of a jet, right? Like we can fly in that jet. It gets us somewhere quickly. Look at the jig, right? Or we can even, I can use, I can jig the line. Or we can jog. Can you show me how you jog? We can jog in place, running slowly. So here what we did, what's different about this is target those new sounds, target those new 22 sounds. If your student already has these skills in their language, target the new sounds, expand it and include, include the language, include the words, include the meanings, include visuals, include total physical response. These are the things that we know work for English learners, right? And have them get to see how does that map on to the print? You did it well as an auditory skill. Let's link it to the print. Let's link it to the meaning, right? And let's use it in a sentence. Let's link it to language. Let's link it to vocabulary. That's what would look different for my English learner. All right. So how difficult would that be for you to do? Not so difficult, but it's really meeting the needs of these students, their language needs, right? And connecting everything that we do to language. So I'd like to share with you, what are the, some of the sounds that really, what I call complete transfer? That means these sounds, for example, exist in Spanish and exist in English. B, m, n, d, s, g, t, l, v, v, y. And even that w sound, we will say, oh, it's borrowed. But no, the sound exists. It's spelled differently, right? Like I might say, Cuando, which means when, but I said cuando. That sound is in there. So there are so many sounds. These are just sounds of the consonants that transfer. There's digraphs that transfer. There's vowels that transfer. So let's capitalize upon that. And how do you figure out what transfers and what doesn't? Well, there's a website called mylanguages.org. It has 80 different languages and it tells you which sounds transfer from those native languages to English. So let's use that knowledge. So here I can, I've, we've been working on the phonology. You were able to manipulate some words. Now let's really think about that sound some more. Say jam, say jet, say jog. Jig, what sounds did you hear? You heard j. I'm going to write them. Now let's look at the letter. I'm going to give you a word to remember jaguar. That's an animal in the cat family, it can run very fast. Can you say that word in English for me? Jaguar. Very good. Do you have this word in Spanish? Oh, you do. Tell me about this. Jaguar. Oh, excellent. Now let's try saying that sound again. J. Ah, or if you're having trouble, I want you to put your hand right here in your throat, your vocal cords, and I want you to say this sound from your language. Ch -ch -ch. Very good. Did you feel your throat vibrate, the vocal cords vibrate? They didn't. So now we're going to say the new sound, but this time I want you to say ch, but you're going to make your vocal cords vibrate. We're going to add voicing. Say ch with your voice box on, and that becomes j. Voice box off, ch. Vo voice box on, j. Let's see if we can distinguish the difference between ch and j, ch and j. We're going to get to that precision of the sound. Now let's use that word, say j, j. Now we're going to say jaguar. Can you tell me a sentence with that word jaguar? Oh, yes, the jaguar can run very fast, faster than a human. Let's practice reading words. Let's link what we've just learned. And we're going to practice reading words that have this sound j and particular types of syllables in our language. We're also going to practice writing. So as I took you through this, I want to just point out to you language, language, language. What did, how did I address phonology? I asked him to tell me the sound that was the same. How did I address semantics, the meaning? I asked them if they knew what it meant and I gave them what it was and what it meant. How did I address, um, how did I address using? I asked them to say it in a sentence. I asked them also to make sure it was, you know, we wanted to make sure it was grammatically correct, right? And I also highlighted the connections across languages. So right here in this whole process here, I went through the sounds, the phonology, the semantics, the words, right? Um, the uh, syntax and the use. 
So this is really embedding language into these early skills of literacy. Now, what's different about the English language that maybe is not so much in other languages? The English language has six types of syllables. And why do we need to learn them? As an English learner, that would be so helpful to know, when do I say E and when do I say E, eh, right? When do I say O? Oh, when do I say ah? Oh? Right? Really knowing the differences between those short and long vowel sounds of the English language. In my language of Spanish, there's only five vowel sounds. They never ever change. So that's why we learn about these syllables and these syllable types. So I see a word like men, hip, not, and cup. What I see there is that every one of those had at least one consonant after it. And that's when I'm gonna say the short vowel sounds, eh, it, ah, eh, uh. And what's the opposite of that? Ah, when it ends in a vowel. And then I'm gonna say me, hi, no, the long vowel sounds. So now I know not to say me, he, no. I know to say me, hi, no. So the open syllable ends in the vowel and the closed syllable ends in a consonant. Now I know the difference between men and pronunciation of that E and me. I also have this pattern in my own language. When I look at that, I wanna say name, teme, fibe, rope, cube, because we pronounce all the letters in the sounds of the language. But you have to teach me that no, you're not gonna pronounce that final E. And when you have that vowel, the consonant and the E, the vowel's gonna be long and the E will be silent. It won't, don't pronounce it. So now I know to say name, theme, five, rope, cube. Right. And I might even have this pattern like in English, you have the word dame and in Spanish for me, that's dame. Right. It doesn't mean the same. And I'm pronouncing all the sounds. So I've got to know this pattern. Right. But I've got to make the connection also to the meaning. We have this pattern also in Spanish, that vowel with the R, like in star, her, sir, world, fur, right? It makes an unexpected sound. Most of the times it's going to say er, but look at AR. It says R, right? And I also can look at that OR when it followed that W, it said er, right? But if I said the word doctor, it also said er, it was unaccented. Or if I say dollar, so my students need to learn, oh, don't say dollar. Don't say collar, don't say doctor, don't say tutor, right? I have to learn, oh, huh? let's see, say doctor. Let me put my hand under my chin, doctor. On that first syllable, my mouth opened wider. I emphasized it, I accented it. So the second syllable, I'm gonna say the er sound, right? Tutor, oh, tutor, right? My mouth and what you heard was open wider and my voice was stronger. And now that second syllable said er. So now I have to learn about, and I have to know not to say ar, er, right? And I have to learn that it's one sound because in my language, it would be two sounds, ordinario, right? Ordinary. So that's something quite challenging, but you can teach me that. Here's the other thing. We also have those vowel pair syllables, right? And uh, they make their own sounds, just like in English, but the sounds will be different. So when I say A-I, oh, we know that you have to be careful that there it's going to say A, like in sale, right? For me, when I see A-I, it says I, aislado, right? So the A-I in Spanish says I, the A-I in English says A. I've got to know those differences, right? The E-I in Spanish says A. And the EY says A, teach me about how, what are the connections to that vowel pair EI? And then those final endings, candle, sample, ankle, uncle, puzzle, or shun, jun, chur, jur. I might have some of these, like in the word English cable, I have gable, or a waffle, waffle, right? But we're pronouncing the vowel sounds differently. And so you've got to teach me. And once you teach me about this, then let me practice maybe a word sort. Let me practice reading. Let me practice learning the words. But knowing those six syllable types helps me to read the words more correctly. It helps me to produce them, those vowel sounds correctly. And then you're gonna connect it to the language so I can really understand the vocabulary of that very well, all right? So I talked about J. I talked about phonological awareness and 
really phoneme awareness. We were changing sounds. I talked about the graphophonemic knowledge, you know, putting that letter, that sound and the letter together. And I talked about also knowing about syllables of English. Really, that's really knowing a lot about the structure. But now I want to apply it. Oh, and decoding practice can be so boring. But what we're going to do is we're going to liven it up. And what we're going to do is we're going to meet and help our English learners by bringing in language as we work on these early literacy skills. So let's look right here. We're going to be reading closed syllables. And that means each one of these, remember, each one of these is going to end in a consonant. And the vowel is going to be the short sound. So let's get ready. And if you want to, you can you know, put a little marking there, that brief, to remember that that's a short sound. Either a, a, a. Ready, read. And the students will read jam, jet, jig, jet, jam, right? But one of the things I want to point out, students, is I want you to look at these words again. And I want you to pay attention to some sounds. We, You know the sound j. I want you to read the words that not only have that sound j, but also have that sound a. Ah. Which words would those be? Correct, students. You said and read jam, jab, Jan, nice work. I really like the way you were thinking about the phonological features of these words, the sound features. Let's look at these next row. And I want you to prepare every word. And remember to look, those are closed syllables, right? We have consonants. We're going to say the short vowel sounds. Ready? Read. And they might read Jim, Jog, Jack, Jen, Just. Very good. Now, I want you... Uh, to look at these words more carefully. And I'm going to ask you to tell me which ones of these words are person's names. We're going to pay attention to the vocabulary and the meaning. And they might say, Jim, Jack, Jen. Good job. How did you know? That's right. It had a capital letter. Those are person's names. Which one of these can be someone's work? job. You are correct. You've really been learning the meanings of these words. Next, let's prepare every word. We've seen some of these. Ready? Read. Jet, jig, jam, jack, jam. All right. And we can practice again. If you want to read, we can practice with fluency. But I have a question re related to how these words work. Um, which one of these words could be a noun, names a person, place, a thing, an action, uh, and a describing word. Hmm. Ah, oh, you said jet. Good job. A jet. We talked about that airplane. But also I can jet out of here and I can have an inkjet printer, right? Like this. There's the jet, an inkjet printer, and we can go fast out of here. I can do the same thing uh, with the word jig. We talked about the jig, about jig the line, the fishing jig, and also jig is a dance, right? And what about a puzzle? A jigsaw puzzle, that's a describing. Nice, so now we really looked at the words. We looked at their meanings, we looked at the sounds, the meanings, and how they're used, the grammatical features. Now we're gonna put it to more use. Let's prepare, get ready, read. Just jam, jig, jab, jet. Ah, oh, students, which one of these words is used as a saying, when I want to say, only kidding, what word could I use? Just, just kidding, only kidding. Or which ones would, oh, if there's a lot of cars, you're stuck in a traffic, that's right, in a traffic jam. So we had talked about the jam before when we did phonological awareness. Now we're talking about traffic jam. And if I want to listen to my music, I'm going to jam to the music is another saying. So this just is a description of how even when we're doing decoding practice, we can very strategically and systematically embed the phonology, the vocabulary, the grammar, and the pragmatics, always paying attention to students' language and their skills of language as we're developing literacy. We also want to work on the fluency. And one of the things that we've learned is that, you know, these students might be able to learn to, you know, code the words rather well. 
but don't assume just because they can code them and they can learn to read them fluently, that that's really going to get to that ultimate goal of comprehension. I'm going to need to do some extra work, right? I'm going to need to do some extra work on the meanings of those words, the expressive kind of languages we're doing, and also know that just because I've got reading fluency, right, for English learners, reading fluency and comprehension is moderated by that oral language proficiency. And so that's why we must be focused on the oral language skills as we're developing literacy skills. And they can, as I've just shown you, they can complement one another quite well, like we just did here. Now, I love words and I love knowing a lot about words. So some of the best word learning strategies uh, for these students are what we call cognate awareness and morphological awareness. And we need to make sure they have multiple, multiple, multiple opportunities for using them uh, in, in creating the, the context in which they can use them. And so what is a cognate? A cognate is that ability to recognize that, oh my God, this word in this new language of English actually looks similar to a word in my language, similar in spelling and perhaps similar also in meaning. And here's the example of the word canoe that looks the same in English and Catalan, canoa, the same in Spanish, Italian and Portuguese and looking at canoe in French and German. So I could take these kinds of words and I can really introduce it kind of like in chunks related to specific areas of subjects or things that we're learning about. And so here's an example of in Spanish, auto, tractor, tren, canoa, helicóptero. Does that look familiar? Do those words look familiar to you for English? I'm sure they do. Auto, tractor, train, canoe, helicopter. All right, so we're going to make those connections of these cognates, right? And we're going to explore the features around these cognates. So the word is canoe. Say the word, students, canoe. In Spanish, what's the word? Or in your home language, what's the word? Canoa. How many syllables? Put your hand under your chin. Canoa. Oh, in Spanish, it has three syllables. Your mouth opened three times. How about in English? Canoe. Ah, oh, it has two syllables because your mouth opened twice, there's two vowel sounds. Let's see how many sounds um, in Spanish. K -a -n -o -a. How many was that? Five. How many in English? K -a -n -u. Four. How many meaning units? If I see that word canoe, does it have one meaning there? Is there anything added to it? If I said the word canoes, that would be more than one in that case, right? So that would have two meaning units. So, uh, how is a canoe that we have up here, how is that the same or different from a ship? Ah, oh, that canoe is much smaller than the ship, right? The canoe doesn't have an engine, right? We're going to use some oars to paddle, right? And then the ship, oh, that, can, that ship can probably fit a thousand people. How many can fit in the canoe? Maybe two, right? Is the word a noun? Does it name a person, place, or thing? Yeah. Can you use it as an action word, a verb? We're going to canoe down the river, perhaps. Can you use it in a sentence? I'm going to be listening for complete sentences, students. Now let's look at the spelling, C-A-N-O-E. Oh, how's that different from canoa? Ooh, that E is different than canoa. What did I do right here? Remember language? What did I do? I asked him about the sounds and the syllables. What about semantics? I asked him about the meanings. We talked about the meaning. I asked him about the morphemes, right? That's the morphology. I asked him about the grammar and I asked him to use and we extended it to spelling. So right here, once again, what do you see? You see the components of language and we added that component of orthography, spelling. Once again, we're doing routines, 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 and the students start using this as these metalinguistic skills. This is how they start thinking too, in more depth, in more depth. So as students learn to read, they're taught to attend to the smallest units of sounds to decode those words. 
and to the morphemes to understand the meanings of new words. So just like I did with the cognates, I can do that with the morphemes, the small units of meanings, right? And I've, I've actually developed lessons where I have 90 morphemes that are the same between Spanish and English. And we have this in other languages. English is, has 60% of the English language comes from Latin. So anything that's Latin based and 15% comes from the Greek. So just think about those Latin and Greek words and how we can make this interesting for our students. So there I have Spanish breakfast, anti, English, anti, X, X, Audi, Audi, Fono, ah, uh, Greek, Fono with a PH, Ista, Ist, Itis, Itis. Next week, I'm doing a presentation in Barcelona. And by the way, they do Catalan, Spanish, and English. And I'm able to do the very same thing in three languages. Um, and um, this is, it works in so many languages. So if you look right here, we see this prefix. A prefix is at the beginning of a word. Say these words, bilingual, bicycle, bi-monthly. What did you hear at the beginning that was the same? Bi, watch as I write the words. How do you, what do you see in the very beginning? B-I. Do any of these words look familiar? They might say, bilingue, bicicleta, bimensual. If you speak two languages in English, we say you're bilingual. Something that you pedal and has two wheels is a bicycle. If you do something twice per month or every two months, bi-monthly. So bi means what? Two. Let's think if we have other words. Oh, I know. Two times a week or every two weeks, bi-weekly. Two times a year, bi-annually. Are those any words in your language? Ah, bianual, bisemanal, very good. I want to bring these words to life. We're going to be working with these words in stories. We're going to be putting them up. And as we listen to people, you know, when you read or as you read or as we listen to people speak and as we study more, we're going to be adding to your own personal journal, your own personal vocabulary notebook. And we're going to be adding to our word wall to create. Let's have a contest to see how many we can come up with, right? I've seen schools that they do that and they have a tree in the right in the entrance and it's competitions between classes. How many, who can come up with the most? And we'll have, you know, extra recess time or PE time or pizza party on Friday. But this is really making uh, this wonderful word learning strategy and having the students really have that opportunity. And what did I do here? Again, we really looked at the sounds, the meanings, the use, all of it. So I'd like to end today thinking about what I call 3PV3RQ. And I just wanted an easy way to think about those evidence-based practices that are described for comprehension. And when they're described, I, I want, it says, uh, you know, in these national reading panel reports, it says that we should really be using multiple strategies and we should be doing kind of like a cooperative learning and um, that we have to do comprehension monitoring. I mean, this, these are the things that we've learned. So an easy way for me to remember is my three Ps. What is the purpose of what we're going to read? My next P is to prepare that connection, build upon that background knowledge, explore that background knowledge, get them ready to read. We call that front loading. Let's make some predictions and to see if our predictions come true. And the V is the vocabulary. What here in the text, right? What here in this text are some words that would potentially really contribute for them understanding what they're reading? Then I'm going to have them read, right? And I might have them read multiple times because we're going to build fluency and comprehension. We'll review what we've read. But I want to do something very special. I want them to retell and summarize to me. That retelling really solidifies. And they might retell to me, retell to a partner. And I will have them question, but not only answer questions, but ask questions. And especially those higher order questions of how and why and what if, right? So as we think about 3PV, 3RQ, we're embedding and making a routine, those eight evidence-based practices that we know of from these national literacy panel reports. So let's put it all together, 3PV, 3RQ. So the students, so students, the first P, 
purpose. So the purpose of today's reading is to really make sure that you can read successfully words that have your new sound of j, and you learn ng as ng, and you learn that letter z as and that letter R is rrr. those are all new sounds for you in the English language. But also this week, we've been talking about the kind of work that people do, right? Uh, and so let me ask you, if we think about that, um, can, uh, if we look right here at this passage right here at the very top, let's look at the title. What do you see? A-R-T. Oh, what does that spell? Art. We also have here A-N-N. Artisans, artisans. Oh, so and like a musician, a person who makes music, an artisan. What do you think it's about? Persons who create art. That's right. So let me ask you, and let's explore. What do you consider art? What have you ever done that is could be considered art? Oh, some of you said you paint. Others said you make ceramics. Others said. Um, you can color. <laughs> uh, I'm not very good at art. So anything that you can make is way better than what I can make. So as we look at this, we're going to be, we've been talking about jobs that people do. So perhaps this passage is going to be about the jobs that people do related to art. So let's prepare and let's read. And so I would have the students, you know, read sentence by sentence. We prepare. Jim makes rings for his job. The rings are for men and women. Jim rubs the rings with the cloth. Jim is content with his rings. Zach is an artist. Zach makes rude pets. So we're going to go sentence by sentence. I also need for my English learners to work on the fluency. And what I might do here is I might do some pencil swings. Jim makes rings for his job. This will be so helpful. The rings are for men and women. So here we're getting at the cadence. We're going, you know, how does that phrasing work, right? And now after we do that, we can read it, right, as if we're speaking to a friend. That would be really uh, terrific. So uh, I want them to read. We're going to, uh, but before I really, oops, I skipped something. The front loading, sorry about that, should have included some vocabulary words. So here I see this word come up here um, about uh, uh, content. So it means he's happy. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. But I want you to put your hand under your chin and say content. You, you emphasize the second syllable. But if I say content, it means person's things. But content means happy. So when it says Jim is content with his rings, it means he's happy. And then uh, we go through, what does Jim do? He makes rings. Who are they for? Men and women. And it says Jim rubs the rings. What is he rubbing them with? A cloth. He's happy. Zach makes what? Zigzags. He's content. Rinsing songs. And then I can ask these questions. What's Jim's job? Can you tell me in a complete sentence? Do you know the job title? Why does Jim rub the ring with a cloth? What does Zach do? What color are the pots? Where does Ren sing songs? Since Ren sings, what do you think his job is, right? Now we're going to, um, we're going to uh, retell, we're going to retell that to, um, to, um, uh, to the person next to you, right? Uh, so that would be uh, very good. All right. So right here, if we think about what did I do, exit out of here. Uh, what did I do here? I had the students, you know, talk about the purpose. What's it about? We explored, you know, anything that they know about the topic at hand. They made a prediction. We explored that word content. We had them read. We review with them. We have them retell to a partner. And we had question answering. But the other thing I want to do is question generation. Can you come up with some other questions? Can you put a question in the chat box, students? Um, a question in the chat box that begins with how or why. Can you write a question in the chat box? So they might say something like, well, how does Zach make those red pots anyway? What is a zigzag or how can you make a zigzag? Would it go horizontally or vertically, right? Why does Ren sing those songs? 
And why doesn't it say he's content? What do we think about that? All right. So what I've described to you is taking those components of language, phonology, semantics, morphology, syntax, pragmatics, and think about how they fit into this framework of literacy, phonological awareness, right? Phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, and really show you how we can systematically and explicitly, systematically and explicitly add in, right? all these components of language as we're developing literacy. So I wanna ask you something today. Is there something in this session that made you really think that maybe there's something here that you can implement and take away from what you've heard today? And can you set a calendar to remind yourself to review that progress? And can you share those experiences with your colleagues? And so I'm going to ask you about that. If you want to share in that chat box, that would be wonderful. So here are some resources, uh, the Literacy Foundations for English Learners, a comprehensive guide to evidence-based instruction, which will go over, you know, those components of literacy and the research to practice of how we can, you know, uh, really think about this as we design our instruction to meet the needs of these individual students. Uh, for the last five years, we've had a grant for the Office of Special Education Programs. Um, I was with the team of Dr. Linda Cavazos and Dr. Alba Ortiz, and we have MTSS for ELS.org. And there you'll find uh, some great literacy briefs that would be very helpful to read and some rubrics about how to implement tiered instruction, but really thinking about these um, English learners. At dyslexiaida.org, um, we have, you know, fact sheets, but what also I want to tell you, if we have standards for teaching all the knowledge, it's called KPS, the Knowledge and Practice Standards for the Teaching of Reading. We have that for the English language, for teaching reading in English, all the things you need to know about. But we also developed that for Spanish. And when I, it's on there, I just want to let you know, it's not a translation. We actually wrote that everything a teacher needs to know if they're gonna work in native language literacy, such as Spanish and teach that Spanish language. And Colorín Colorado, they've done a nice job of really working uh, and addressing the needs of uh, English learners. And I have some video clips on there about assessment and treatment and things for families. And as I mentioned to you, at the University of Houston, there's the Center for the Success of English Learners. It's a brand new grant that's really going to be focused on adolescent English learners. And so uh, it's just getting off the ground. There is there some information that you could get there, um, but you know, within another year, there'll be much more. And uh, so be on the lookout uh, for that. All right, let me turn it over. Well, thank you, Elsa, for that amazing session, amazingly informative. Um, I believe we were having a little bit of reverb, perhaps because you were not on mute. So while I ask the questions, maybe if you could put yourself on mute, it doesn't seem to be happening now, but that might, that might be helpful. Um, so again, thank you so much. We do have some time for questions, so I'm thrilled to ask a bit. But before we do, I just wanted to remind you all about the companion document that we've created to accompany uh, each webinar. The webinar companion document includes prompts to discuss after the webinar and uh, additional resources to further explore that webinar content. And if you could progress to the next slide, on it we have our survey that we love for everyone who is in attendance to fill out. So uh, when we'll pop this survey link in the chat. And while we're asking questions to Elsa and Dr. Cardenas Hagen, um, please do uh, fill out that survey or fill it out after. So we've gotten a lot of really great questions in the chat, and I will start by 
uh, asking this one from one of our attendees. How do we teach explicit grammar to students when we have students with different L1s? I feel like my non-Spanish speakers are left out when I point out cognates, semantics, syntax, morphemes, and root words compared to Spanish, but then have nothing for my Farsi and Arabic speakers. You know, so Arabic is an alphabetic language. It, it has an alphabet. <laughs> and so uh, you can do the very same things that I described with you today in, in all languages. And as I mentioned, so, you know, where am I going to start from? Okay, well, let's look. Is it an alphabetic language or a non-alphabetic language? If it's an alphabetic language, I can make those connections, right? Uh, can we look at what sounds exist in the two languages and what connections can we make? How about even maybe some sound approximations? I can go on and I can actually click and listen um, to the particular sounds. The other thing that I can do is I can look at, okay, in your, and I can ask, in your language when it you know you know when you're describing something or saying something does the word that has that tells a person place or thing come before the action or is does the action come before and um or do you have any describing words and where do those describing words fit before the noun or after the noun so these are you know i could bring up those kinds of you know things about the structure the grammatical structure uh, features with any language and by asking the students to tell me or I can actually kind of research and, and discover those uh, myself and you would be surprised that uh, there are words across I mean I even have words in Vietnamese that are cognates with English so you'll be surprised at what you can find. In order to be so explicit in your instruction, it seems that a teacher would have to have a really robust background knowledge in language themselves, in the phonology of their own language to start. Do you have resources to recommend of uh, books or uh, websites to suggest where teachers can help build their own knowledge of English phonology and morphology in order to be more explicit yeah. in their instruction? Yeah. Um, you know, it's really, we, um, at the International Dyslexia Association, uh, we partnered with Reading Rockets, and we have um, nine kind of modules on each of the features of language and how this would look and about the sounds, and, and it's called Reading 101. And, and it also has how you would, you know, like film clips of how that would be implemented. Uh, and so I think, you know, starting with that would be really uh great and um it's all for free and you know even if you're if you're a leader and of a campus out there you might want to do that kind of like a little study okay we'll do module one and let's let's go through and there's also little quizzes that go with it if you want to see if you came away with the knowledge in the correct way uh, i think that's um that's always a, a good uh, thing the other thing that uh, and i mentioned my languages.org but the other thing that we have to be uh, so I think that really helps you to look at, you know, how do you teach reading and what's the structure of, of that. Um, but the other thing we have to be mindful of is um, making sure that, um, you know, every student in there, like you were saying, you all have a lot of different other languages. And I, and I do tell you, my work has primarily been in Spanish speaking English learners, but that doesn't mean other colleagues that we have across, you know, um, uh, across the world aren't doing the same kind of work and the same kind of strategies they are and um, finding in their studies that uh, this works because it really isn't that you know so our brains are we're humans we you know we learn to speak um, but we can also learn uh, to read and and when we look in the brain you know reading is so language based and at, so we have to have strong language skills and um, with that hope that we can also build those strong literacy skills. And the more we have of our language skills, the better our literacy will be. But that doesn't mean that I'm not gonna ignore structure. I'm gonna do both. I'm gonna work on language while I work as structure. And I wanna kind of break the myths that, you know, if you, that, that this kind of approach would not work for a multilingual learner, but absolutely, you know, absolutely it will work. And yes, we're being mindful of the language skills and bringing in their culture and their language and this linguistic knowledge. And, and the children love it. They love when they know so much about their language. And as I said before, you know, this supports, you know, their language supports their reading. But as we teach them to read and as they read widely, 
that supports language. So the more you read, that supports your language development. And the more language you have, that supports your reading. But you've got to know in these early years that structure of how it works so that we can read that complex text and have that wonderful opportunity to read, you know, books and about anything across the world. And it'll really, and I think about what's the bridge? What's the bridge to equity? Literacy is the bridge to equity. That's what I say. And if we don't do these things, then it's not, it's not equitable. It's not fair. And so we really want to make sure that um, we're giving these opportunities to develop language, to develop literacy simultaneously, strategically, systematically, explicitly. And we help these children to become metalinguistic. And they start thinking in that very same way because we taught them a strategic way to think and a strategic way to read. Well, that is perfect. That is all the time we have for today, although we could still ask you many, many questions. In fact, I will collect the questions and if we can't answer them ourselves, we can forward them on to Dr. Cardenas Hagen. I wanna thank you for your time on behalf of Glean Education, the Sacramento County Office of Education and the California Dyslexia Initiative. And thank you to our wonderful attendees who take the time in the evening to join us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar with Dr. Marianne Wolf on reading instruction and social justice. That should be marvelous. Yeah, we love her. 3rd. She's fantastic, as She's are you. Amazing. So thank She's you, Dr. Dr. Thank Dr. Cardenas Hagen. This was just beyond a pleasure. So much to learn. Thank, thank you. you. Fabulous. Bye. -bye.